All right, welcome back everybody for part six of the Parallax Occlusion Map series. Uh, today I wanted to spend a few moments talking about how nanite uh, or true mesh geometry compares to kind of a fairly complete parallax occlusion map shader and some of the considerations. So in front of you now, you are looking at uh, both a nanite mesh and a parallax occlusion map um, surface. And I'd like you to take a guess as to which one is which. And I'll reveal it now on the left is the nanite mesh and on the right is our parallax occlusion mapped mesh. The nanite mesh has 500,000 vertices and uh, a million triangles, uh, whereas this one here has two triangles. So uh, some considerations. Uh, first is visual quality, and we'll talk about shadows to get started. So as I've mentioned in the past, um, there are some issues and limitations with parallax occlusion mapped shadows. First is you'll notice that when using virtual shadow maps, um, the quality is better to my eyes anyway on the nanite mesh. Uh, you get more detailed shadows on smaller objects. Um, now you could probably refine the parallax occlusion map to shadow even more to bring them closer to each other. Uh, but this ultimately has to do with the fact that we are tracing rays along steps and with small quantities of step counts, uh, it will miss certain details and uh, the, the nanite mesh is not missing those details. If we were to actually go to cascading shadow maps, uh, in my eye, at this point now, the parallax shadows actually look better um, because I've tuned them to, you know, the, the harder, more accurate and detailed virtual shadow maps, whereas the cascading shadow maps are lower resolution and end up being too soft and blurry for um, this particular scene. But uh, that is what it is. Um, next is going to be just kind of those worst case scenario extreme angles for parallax occlusion mapping, right? If we come down to the nanite mesh, um, obviously it doesn't look great this close under this level of scrutiny either, but uh, it remains sharp and detailed. Uh, even to you know, these extreme angles. The parallax occlusion mapping obviously uh, does not look sharp once we get to these extreme angles due to the uh, fact that we have discrete steps. And in this case, we're of course um, using our anti-stair stepping technique, but uh, even with 100 and 128 steps here, it doesn't match um, the parallax occlusion, or it doesn't match, match the nanite mesh in sharpness. Um, so going back, I guess, to shadows for a second, another difference, as I mentioned in the shadow video, is going to be with uh, issues in artifacts, like for example, double shadowing when areas are in shadow from uh, a shadow caster, and then the material adds a second shadow due to the way that that's calculated. Uh, so that detracts from the visual quality. And then over distance as well, parallax occlusion mapping, uh, you know, is going to, the quality is going to be mainly affected by bit maps and uh, Parallax uh, occlusion mapping will end up being blurrier as a result, whereas with the nanite mesh, uh, we actually have the uh, the geometry uh, being factored in, and nanite knows where the details are and preserves them better, causing a, a sharper image at a distance. Uh, so to my eyes, nanite looks better at a distance, it looks better in shadows, it looks better at steep angles, um, and generally wins in pretty much every visual category. Um, where, uh, you know, I guess some other considerations, uh, one that nanite might lose in is technically it is lower detail. As I mentioned, this is 500,000 vertices. I, I made a 1 million vertice 
plane um, and then displaced it and then decimated it down to 500,000 vertices. Uh, whereas a 4K displacement map like this is displacing per pixel. There are 16 million, almost 17 million pixels in a 4K texture. Uh, so at its highest quality MIP level, uh, there are actually uh, far more points of detail on this than there is on the Nanite Mesh. Uh, you could theoretically, obviously, subdivide the Nanite Mesh down to 16 million polygons, but uh, or 16 million vertices, but uh, it's really not necessary because you'll notice that even in this instance where we, you know, we have 16 million per pixel displacement compared to 500,000 uh, vertices. The perceived level of detail is actually pretty comparable on each of them, so not that big of a deal. Um, so uh, next would be performance. Okay, well, how do they compare performance-wise? If we go over to our stat GPU, we grab our plane, and let's um, hop over to our nanite mesh. All right. So during with a nanite mesh with no visible standard non nanite objects, our base pass is going to be extremely low, in this case 0 0.03 milliseconds. But we're going to have a couple of nanite specific passes. Uh, for our nanite base pass, it's 0.75. And for our nanite vis buffer, it's 0.58. So we'll, we'll call it um, 1.25 between both of those. And we also have our shadow depths from our uh, nanite mesh being a shadow caster. Um, and that is currently costing one millisecond, uh, roughly. So uh, let's just call it, I don't know, 2.3 2 uh, milliseconds for shadows uh, included and 1.3 without. Then if we get rid of this and we go to our parallax occlusion mapped mesh, we're looking at the same angle. Uh, and here our base pass is going to jump up. It's currently uh, it just keeps moving around on me, 0 0.91, you know, about a millisecond. Um, so it went up from set 0.75 on the nanite base pass to the standard base pass, base pass of one millisecond. But because we don't have as much nanite objects in the scene, our nanite, in fact, we have none, but it's, there's still a cost there. Our nanite base pass has dropped down to next to nothing, and our nanite vis buffer has also dropped down a lot. Uh, so we're still at about 1.33 milliseconds, but our um, shadow depth uh, buffer is actually cut in half as well at about 0.6 milliseconds instead of, uh, point, instead of one millisecond because we are casting um, simpler shadows, uh, right, without that nanite mesh in the scene. Um, in fact, this technically isn't casting any shadows at all, but even if I were to enable shadow casting on it, uh, our shadow depths are going to be lower than um, nanite, although not considerably from the look of it. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily count on getting savings there if you're um, you know, planning on having your parallax occlusion map cast shadows. But I mean, that's one of the benefits of nanite, right, is we can get these high levels of detail and we can have it cast through shadows, um, such as down here, without needing to mess around with uh, proxy shadow casters like we have with the uh, parallax occlusion mapped material. So um, all in all, uh, they're actually really close in pretty much all facets, right? You get a pretty similar visual quality. You get a uh, pretty similar performance. You get a uh, pretty similar use cases. But there are a couple of situations um, where they're going to run, run into differences and issues. And so first is, I would say that whenever possible, you should probably be using Nanite. Uh, it's very good. Uh, and it gives what I think is superior results. Um, but it isn't always possible, right? There are certain cases where Nanite isn't going to be uh, a good fit, either because it makes your workflow more difficult or because it's just technically impossible. Workflow issues can usually be overcome, right, by building different tools to interact with um, that workflow differently. 
like for example, uh, automated ways of turning your height maps into nanite meshes, for example. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, a tiling texture for a terrain, as it currently stands, doesn't support nanite, right? And so you can get parallax occlusion mapping working in those instances, and you can't get nanite working in those instances. So it makes parallax occlusion mapping an easy win. Uh, decals, uh, you know, if you are trying to take a, a mesh and add decals onto it to add detail, uh, parallax, you know, you can use parallax occlusion mapping on decals and add uh, depth in the way that uh, is probably most, most obviously known from uh, Star Citizen, for example. Uh, Whereas with Nanite, you can get those same details, but you'd have to physically model them in. So, uh, you know, there's a, a difference in work and workflow. So all in all, uh, I don't think that Nanite makes parallax occlusion mapping obsolete, but I do think that when you are in a situation where you're choosing between which one to use, I would try to make Nanite work for your situation first, and then look into parallax occlusion mapping as, uh, kind of a backup, right? In cases where you can't get uh, Nanite to suit your needs, then parallax occlusion mapping can deliver a lot of the visual quality uh, in its niche cases, uh, but the compromises uh, can't be ignored either. But I think that's all for now. So thanks for watching and have a good one.